In times of war, art becomes a historical record reflecting the turbulence of the times. But it can also shine a light on the human spirit's strength and ability to persist. One Afghan artist is making those messages loud and clear in the streets of Kabul. Meet artist Omaid Sharifi. Omaid is an Afghan artist and curator. In 2014, he co-created Art Lords, a nonprofit organization that uses art as a means of social transformation. Artists and ordinary citizens have painted thousands of murals on concrete blast walls in Afghanistan with messages calling for hope, unity, and inclusion. When it comes to Afghanistan, I think poverty was the elephant in the room. So when there's poverty and that level of violence, uh, a lot of people, uh, they don't take art seriously. They don't talk about it. They don't care about it. Uh, if it's from the, uh, the government, if it's from the artists, if it's from the international community, which we're involved in Afghanistan, in our case, um, there's little resources or little focus uh, on art and cultural heritage. But if you look at it from a very uh, different perspective, it's one of the most important uh, things uh, if you invest in art. It has the highest return on investment because art makes you uh, hopeful. It makes you see a better future for yourself, for, for your kids. If you're in, in a violent environment like Afghanistan, in a conflict, in a war, war zone, I think it's art that brings a bit of kindness, a bit of empathy, it's art that brings a bit of joy and happiness. Omaid is also currently a fellow at Harvard and was named a 2016 Millennium Leadership Fellow by the Atlantic Council. Let me ask you about your childhood. Uh, growing up in Afghanistan, uh, how did that fuel who you are today? I mean, you could be just an artist, but you're an activist, artivist. Um, how much of that is because of growing up in the environment you grew up in? I was born in Kabul, and Kabul city, uh, although it was in the middle of the Soviet invasion, but I remember growing up in a city where you loved and trusted your neighbor more than your family. Uh, you knew everybody in the city, in the community that you were living, you knew everybody, and everybody knew you. I recall, I never recall an elderly person, woman or man, carrying their own goods from the shops to their home, because the moment we would see this, as kids, we would just go there and pick up that grocery bags and take it to their homes. Um, you would be scared of your neighbor's father as much as you were scared of your father, because if he saw you doing something wrong, he would really beat you. <laughs> so it was a, a, a community living in a big city like Kabul city, uh, a lot of kindness and love despite the violence and conflict. Um, Although we were very poor, but we were poor with dignity. Uh, everybody was trying their best hard to stay alive and also work hard to feed their families. Um, and like many of those people who were in Kabul at that time, I also grew up on the streets. When I was 12 years old, I had to help my father with the shop uh, and I was selling cigarettes on the streets because I was the oldest son of the family and I had uh, younger sisters, uh, and we have big families in Afghanistan. So I felt responsible to contribute as a, at a very young age. Um, and this is not the story of me, but the story of a lot of people who was growing up with me at those times. Um, I think all of those really contributed to who I became or who I am today. And I never ever left Afghanistan. I lived all my life. I was born, educated, living, working in Afghanistan. And this is the first time I'm living somewhere outside Kabul city, which is my, my homeland. Um, I think I experienced the violence and conf conflict firsthand. I saw a lot of kindness and empathy at the same time when I was growing up. And all of that contributed to the person I am today. Talk to me about uh, what gave you the impetus to create Art Lords. Um, it was 2014, um, and uh, I recall uh, President Obama had announced that uh, a, they had a troop surge in Afghanistan and then they would draw down the troops and most of the American soldiers probably uh, would leave in 2014. So when this was happening, 2014, 
was somehow like a doomsday for Afghanistan. This was how it was portrayed in the local media that once this NATO and American troops leave in 2014, so Taliban will come over and take over and everything will be lost. So that is really sparked us to start our own initiative, to do something to show to the people that young Afghans, they want to do something for their own country. And it was the time that the security industry in Afghanistan was like mushrooming. And they would be selling these high concrete walls. It's like up to 13 meters tall, ugly blast walls. And they'd cost like $2,000 each. And they would be selling this all over the city to the government offices, to the embassies, to the businessmen. So Kabul was becoming like a present. Like I would walk any road, it would be blocked by these security walls. Uh, and somehow people were even buying it for prestige to show that they're rich and powerful. They just put it on their homes. So the whole uh, identity of Kabul city was lost. The space which I would be riding my bicycle or my car was blocked. We wanted to reclaim back that space as well. So 2014 doomsday showing that we want to take an initiative. Also this opportunity to bring down these ugly blast walls that sparked our plots. In 2021, 20 years after they were ousted by U.S. troops, the Taliban returned to power in Afghanistan. On August 15th, the day the Taliban entered the capital, Omaid tweeted a video that showed a new mural being painted along with the text. It reminded me of the famous scene from the Titanic movie, where the musicians play until the ship sinks. We started by talking about Obama and the, and the drawdown and kind of the sense of gloom and doom. But there were different episodes of gloom and doom in your country. Uh, you know, the, the Trump presidency trying to negotiate, uh, Biden saying, mm -hmm. look, we're going to go ahead with the withdrawal. I mean, you, it, it's kind of like you, you're watching this. You know what the ending of the movie is going to be. You don't like it, but you see it coming. Can you describe that period for me and, and uh, the sense of dread, how it grew from the drawdown to now we're sitting here chatting? Um, it, it was a painful process, to be honest. And every time, um, since 2014, I must say, there was always this fear of that, okay, the foreign troops are leaving today, next year, or the year after. So they, there was always, we never felt that there is a long-term commitment to whatever we are doing. And this message really sent uh, uh, like, like made people uneasy about whatever they were doing because you could not plan five years of your life. You could not plan five years of your investment if you're a business person or if you're an artist. You knew all of this is coming down, crippling down someday because the foreigners are talking about it all the time. And especially when the Trump administration uh, decided to talk with the Taliban directly and then Biden administration decided to pull all the troops and like that. So... Um, all of our lives, whatever we had built, was crumbling down in front of our eyes. And it was painful because we had built that not only with our time, but with blood and treasure. And it was not just Avon lives, which was the majority of lives lost, but the international community as well. A lot of troops from NATO, from America, from other places, they died in that country for that cause. And then suddenly you just decide to stop everything and just uh, leave. It was very painful for all of us. And every time I think about it, those times, I still somehow in my heart, I had hope that this was not going to happen. Every fact was against it. But I just hope that I, I just hoped it wouldn't happen. That's why I was stuck in Kabul when the Taliban came, because I was still hoping I was still painting on that day that hopefully we will figure something out. We will talk it out. We'll find a solution for this. You were painting on that day. You tweeted and you said it's sort of like the uh, the band playing on that Titanic. Uh, so that, that sense of uh, sadness that must have just overcome you. Um, so what happens then? I mean, you know that you've turned a page that this is not the kind of world where someone like yourself can create. Because, uh, I mean, your love of Kabul and, and your country that you know... I've got to go, that can't be easy. It's not, um, but the most important uh, point is that we never stopped. So since I was evacuated from Kabul airport, 
I've not taken one day off. I've continued working because it's very important that we keep alive whatever we have built. Although there's a lot of rigorous on, 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 on the achievements we had, but I still have an office open in Kabul, Art Lord's office open in Kabul. I still have 25 artists that I work with every month. So for us, it was very important to keep that hope alive, to keep the work alive. And I think right now what we are doing is our artists, we are sort of recording the history in front of our eyes. All this darkness which has come because of the Taliban in my country, we are recording this. We are creating art, we are creating movies, we are creating artworks for generations to see that what happened in Afghanistan during that time. It's not just murals, it's a movement. So describe that for us. Uh, when we went on the streets of Kabul with a bucket of paint and some brushes and started painting, then we realized how much disengagement is needed. The ordinary people of Afghanistan felt a disconnect with whoever was there. The corrupt politicians, the, the Americans, the NATO, everybody. So there was a disconnect. And these walls were a symbol of that oppression, that disconnect. Because I'm safe behind these walls. I'm safe in my armored cars. And you, the ordinary people of Afghanistan, do whatever you do. You will be dead. You will be dying in explosions and everything. So that need sparked that there's much more we can do. So we did murals together. We did the street theater together because most of us, I never went to a, a gallery show or theater show until I was 35 years old because there was no opportunity. So I knew my people did not have this opportunity as well. So we brought art to the people. We created this visual alphabet for them to understand. Uh, and then you would have a street theater shows on, on every corner of the country. You would have music playing, uh, a beautiful rabab and tabla and somebody playing on, on one of the streets of Kabul. Um, so that's how we brought art on the streets and created sort of a movement where people felt the ownership, they felt engaged, uh, they felt that this is something for them. And it was about solutions. It was not about our problems. We were trying to talk about indigenous solutions for our problems in Afghanistan. When the Taliban ruled two decades earlier, it banned music and destroyed artifacts and artwork. Leading up to the 2021 takeover, artists scrambled to hide their works, but Art Lord's murals were in plain sight. And we painted over 2,200 murals. Only three murals was destroyed. So I, it, it shows how people protected, they took the ownership of these murals. And I know people would, would, would talk to them like their friends and saying, okay, this is the part I painted. Like, mm. like months later, they would take their family and friends and say, this is the part of the mural that I painted. So I think that kind of um, really engaged the whole country. And that's why it went really viral. And then communities and people invited us to their villages and places to paint with them because they thought this is something, some way, this murals could give them a voice. And kind of reclaim a life that's missing too, in a sense, right? Yes. And, um, the power of paint, one doesn't think about the power of paint. Uh, but it's illustrated in a recent tweet that you sent out. I think it was the education minister who was railing against uh, people painting and, and you know, it, you can tell that the Taliban still is kind of fearful of the paintbrush, even more so than a weapon in a way, correct? Uh, correct, I completely agree. Imagine they destroyed most of our murals a week when they were in, in, in power in Kabul. So even they have not announced their cabinet or their government, so there was no Taliban government in place when we, they decided to paint over these murals. Uh, because they know how powerful these messages were. For Omaid, leaving Afghanistan made leaving the only home he has ever known. After the Taliban returned to power, he was evacuated from Kabul to a refugee camp before ending up in the Washington, D.C. area, where he now lives. I think uh, when when Americans uh, think about Afghanistan, they, they think of it through the prism, through the lens of a, of a Western reporter or an American reporter. And, and, and I don't care how objective you are, you're still an outsider, you're coming in and you're telling a story. Mm -hmm. It's a much different story when it's somebody who, who's living there. What are some, some of the misperceptions about Afghanistan? What was it like for you? I mean, 
talk to us about the, the grief and the trauma and what are some of the things that you think were missing in the coverage? I think the biggest misperception is that we are a, a graveyard of the empires as, as there has been many headlines I've seen. We are not. It's actually the graveyard of the Afghans. I've seen so many Afghans who have died in this conflict. Uh, my family members, my friends, the people I grew up, my co-workers, my artists. Um, I think we don't like this conflict. It's not our war most of the times. If you look at it from all the way when the Soviets invaded Afghanistan in 79, until today, somehow somebody else, another country, another thought or another political party, or somebody has been involved in this conflict. Uh, so it's not that we always want this conflict. I think this is a misperception that Afghans are fighters, warriors. Uh, we might be, but we don't start these wars. Um, we are very, very kind people. And it's a very diverse country. 23, 24 languages are spoken in Afghanistan. Different uh, ethnic groups from Uzbeks, Turkmens, uh, Tajiks, uh, Kyrgyz, Pamiris, uh, Pashais, Pashtuns, uh, Hazaras. It's um, so many different ethnic groups. If you stand 10 Afghans together, most probably none of them will look alike because you would see people with blonde hair, with green eyes. You would see people with uh, a very Turkic uh, facial features. Uh, so I think most of the people do not know about our diversity, about uh, the, the kindness and the empathy. And also it's a very beautiful country. It's, it's one of the most beautiful countries I have been. I have traveled a lot in this, in this era. And uh, you have a beautiful country with beautiful mountains, valleys, rivers, and, and forests. Uh, I think these are the things that people should know about the, the Afghanistan. Do you have hope to return someday? Do you, do you see a chance for change there? I do. Uh, my name is Umid, and it's a Persian word. It means hope. Uh, it literally means hope. I mean, people talk, they say, uh, Umid Dharam. They say, I hope. Uh, uh, I literally have hope. I, I, I dream about going back to Kabul when it's free. Uh, I dream about freedom in Afghanistan. Uh, and I am sure we will go back uh, because I am 36 years old now, Mike, and I have seen at least five to six regime changes. And these are very drastic regime changes in Afghanistan from the Soviet invasion to a communist government, to a Mujahideen government, to a civil war, and then uh, to the Taliban government, and then the American invasion, and then Taliban again. So imagine in 36 years, we have seen these kind of changes. The life of this government, this darkness, is not that long. And I hope to go back. Omeid, we leave with hope. Uh, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Sure. Thank you.